Good morning, um, almost afternoon now. Um, thank you guys for having me here today. I uh, initially set out to talk about TEG and TBI, and it kind of quickly devolved into this platelet function and, and uh, TBI, uh, which has kind of a lot of um, conflicting data. So uh, forgive me for a little bit of a switch on, um, on my topic. I do have some disclosures. I do some speaking and consulting for a couple of device manufacturers, none of which have anything to do with this talk. So as we've uh, probably heard several times during this conference, uh, TBI is a very significant problem in the United States. Two million emergency room visits every year, greater than 50,000 deaths every year. That translates to an economic impact in the United States of $80 billion a year. And to give you an idea of scale, um, the gross domestic product of Luxembourg, which is on a per capita basis the wealthiest nation in the world, is only $70 billion. So it's a big impact here in the United States. Uh, obviously, preventing the primary injury would be the best bang for our buck, but most of us in this room spend most of our time trying to prevent secondary injury, so trying to prevent the injured neurons from dying. Um, the Brain Injury Trauma, uh, the Brain Trauma Foundation has great guidelines, and we heard a really good talk yesterday about the pre-hospital um, impact of this. Uh, you know, avoiding hypotension, avoiding hypoxia, watching hyperventilation, these are all very important things to do. These guidelines kind of transiently just talk about correcting a coagulopathy, and they leave it at that. There's not a lot of detail that they go into. So I wanted to, to dig into that a little bit more for this talk. So we'll describe the impact of coagulopathy on TBI. What does that really mean for patients and their outcomes? Um, talk a little bit about uh, viscoelastic testing, so your TAG, your ROTIMS, what extra information that gives us. Um, and then I'm going to go uh, for the rest of the talk into kind of measuring platelet function and what that means for TBI patients both who are taking an antiplatelet agent and those that are, are not. So um, coagulopathy is very, pre very prevalent in TBI patients. Up to two-thirds of TBI patients present with a coagulopathy. Um, it can be related to TBI. Just the mere fact of having an injured brain can cause your coagulopathy. Patients take antiplatelet medications. They take other antithrombotic medications. Uh, there's the coagulopathy of trauma that we see a lot, and then there's what we do to patients with our dilution. So it's very, pre uh, very uh, prevalent. Now, if you have a TBI and you're coagulopathic, uh, makes sense that your bleeding would be worse. This is a meta-analysis that looked at several different studies, and if your INR is greater than 1.2 on your admission, you're more likely to expand your intracranial hemorrhage on your repeat head CT. The same thing holds true. If your platelets are less than 100, you're more likely to expand your uh, intracranial hemorrhage on your repeat head CT. Um, nothing too surprising here. If your blood's thin, you bleed more. Uh, there's other parts of the coagulation cascade that you can look at. If your fibrinogen level is low, that's more likely to progress on a repeat head CT. Um, and if you're using thromboelastic uh, testing, if your um, lysis is elevated, so you're making the clot, but you're breaking it down faster than you should, then that will also lead to an increased chance of a progression on your repeat head CT. Um, that translates to an increased mortality. This is a series of trauma patients. Uh, they were severe head injury patients, greater than an AIS, greater than three. And in this paper, they define coagulopathy as an INR of greater than 1.1, or a platelet count of less than 100. Um, and turns out you spend more time in the ICU if you're coagulopathic, and you're more likely to die. A uh, little bit bigger series looking at the German trauma registry. Uh, again, they looked at patients who are coagulopathic. In this series, that was defined as an INR greater than 1.3 or platelets less than 100. And as you can see, if you have a TBI and you come in coagulopathic, basically everything that can go wrong goes wrong at a higher rate 
for you, including mortality at every time frame that they looked at it. Um, this carries on into the viscoelastic realm as well. Uh, this is a study that looked at neuro ICU patients with intracranial hemorrhage. And if you were hypocoagulable, if you had a coagulopathy that was measured on your tag, you had a higher mortality rate than if you had a normal tag when you were admitted to their ICU. So the next question, if we correct this, does this actually make any difference? And um, this is a study where they divided TBI patients who were coagulopathic into those that had their INR corrected and those that did not. Uh, it turns out if you correct the INR, you improve uh, your patient's mortality. Um, so I wanted to just take a brief time to stop and talk about most of, the, most of the data that we've seen so far has been on conventional coagulation assays. I think it's pretty well known what you do with an elevated INR and what you do with a low platelet count in TBI patients. But the American College of Surgeons is recommending that all level one and two trauma centers have this viscoelastic testing. And that gives us, uh, frankly, a lot more information about the coagulation cascade, but I'm not sure we know exactly what to, to do with it. So I just want to briefly review for you guys, we'll see if this starts, um, what thromboelastography is. So. Uh, is it possible to get this uh, video to play? While well, they're working on it, uh, thromboelastography is a whole blood test instead of spinning your blood down and taking a look at the plasma where we get an INR. Um, you drop a little uh, drop of blood into a cup, you lower a little pin in it, it starts um, uh, rotating back and forth, and you can measure, it, it's okay, you can measure a uh, torsion on, on a wire that's put in there and you draw these interesting graphs that show you kind of how long it takes your clot to get started, how fast it um, progresses to its strength, what its overall strength is, and then over time as the clot lyses can give you information uh, about how quickly you're lysing. Um, a lot of these translate pretty well into our conventional coagulation um, assays, but we don't have a, another good way to measure how much someone is lysing their clot. And we don't really have another good way to measure uh, platelet function. And so one of the advantages of this is that most of these, uh, is that uh, thromboelastic testing has the ability to really sort out how well those platelets are functioning. So not just how many you have, but are they functioning? And so probably a lot of people have heard the term platelet mapping. I just wanted to go over it real quick. What you're running is you're really running four tags at, at the same time. You're running your initial traditional uh, tag, and that gives you this MA thrombin um, that, we can see, that we can see up here. When you uh, initiate a tag using Kalin, it gives you this big burst of thrombin as it comes down the coagulation cascade, and that's a very potent activator of platelets. So oftentimes this will overwhelm any in vivo inhibition you have in your platelets. So, they developed this platelet mapping test to try to sort out uh, how inhibited the, the platelets are. The next one you run is uh, you uh, put your kaolin in, but you also have a reagent that completely knocks out any platelet function whatsoever. So that MA, that MA fibrin is just telling you how much your proteins are produced, how much clot strength your proteins are producing. And it turns out it's usually somewhere between 10 and 20% of your clot strength come from proteins alone. The last two curves you run are you put arachidonic acid in the cup, which um, jump starts your uh, thromboxane pathway, and you also put an ADP agonist in. Um, <clears throat> so then you can go ahead and you can take, compare a ratio. You can say, okay, if I, if I uh, stimulated the ADP receptors, what percent of activity does that give me over, over the total possible? You calculate out this. Uh, percent inhibition. And so that's how people are getting to percent inhibition when you're seeing this in papers. In this curve that you're looking at for arachidonic acid, they would, that would be almost 0% inhibition, whereas for ADP, they'd probably be around 20% uh, inhibition. So that's when people are talking platelet mapping, this is what they're, they're talking about. Um, now, we mentioned TBI-associated uh, coagulopathy a bit earlier. Uh, pretty a complex um, 
mechanisms on, on what causes that that's not totally understood yet. But suffice it to say, you get a brain injury, you will get coagulopathic, and that's independent of the, coagulopo co um, the coagulopathy of hemorrhage, the dilution that we give you when we give you a bunch of crystalloid and you come into our hospital. Um, and there's a lot of theories on what, what um, uh, causes that, but uh, one of the theories is that it's ADP receptor mediated. So here's uh, some of the evidence behind it. This is a, a study that looked at both a rat model uh, of TBI and human subjects. And you give rats a TBI and then measure their tag, and it turns out their ADP receptors get inhibited very shortly after that. And there's almost a dose response. So the more severe your TBI, the more severe your platelet inhibition is that we can measure on platelet mapping. Uh, sorry. Um, then we take and we look at, um, I can't get that to work. If we, we look at uh, 70 isolated TBI patients and 10 healthy controls. And these are all patients that are not taking any antiplatelet medication. They're healthy individuals on no medication. And we find the same results, that the more severely injured you are, the more ADP receptor inhibition you have. Uh, the other thing to point out is that in this study, most patients came in had a normal platelet count. So in those early studies when we were looking at mortality, we would have put them into the normal group when we're now able to demonstrate that they have abnormal platelet function. The same group later published another study looking at isolated TBI patients. Again, these are patients that are not taking any antiplatelet medication. And if you have a TBI, you will show inhibition in your arachidonic acid pathway as well as your ADP receptors. The ADP is pretty good actually at sorting out those that have a severe TBI and those that have a mild TBI, and also sorting out those who are likely to survive and those that are uh, unlikely to survive. In this study, they uh, went on to do a multivariate analysis and found that if your ADP is greater than 60% inhibited, you have an increased mortality rate. Um, <clears throat> So the other problem that we have to face is that a growing number of our patients are on antiplatelet medications um, and or other sorts of uh, anticoagulants. So warfarin, we all kind of know how to deal with that. You check your INR. It's pretty well defined how you reverse that. There's these novel anticoagulants um, that cause a lot of problems for us, but we're not really able to measure how thin they're making the blood. The antiplatelet agents, this is actually what the tag with platelet mapping was designed for. So we can actually measure now how thin your blood is when you're on aspirin or a clopidogrel or there's several other ADP inhibitors. Uh, as it turns out, these uh, medications do uh, have an effect on TBI. If you're taking clopidogrel, you're more likely to expand your uh, intracranial hemorrhage on a repeat head CT. You're more likely to require a neurosurgical intervention. Um, this is uh, another study, again, it's retrospective, it's looking at TBI patients, but this one um, did not exclude patients on aspirin or Plavix. So 30% of these patients were taking aspirin or Plavix, 70% were not. They had severe TB TBIs. And as it turns out, uh, you can almost draw a straight line as your ADP inhibition goes up, your mortality rate goes up. And when you get to that 60%, um, your confidence interval no longer crosses one. Um, they did a multivariate analysis and 60% uh, predicted, 60% inhibition of your ADP receptor tended to predict uh, mortality. Um, so this is just me kind of thinking out loud. It, look, it sounds like it doesn't really matter whether you take antiplatelet medications or not. Um, if your ADP receptor inhibition is greater than 60%, you have an increased mortality rate. This year, this paper came out that I thought, just thought was interesting that at least in rats, if you give them uh, a TBI, they make these little microvesicles get released that go and bind to the ADP receptor um, and cause ADP inhibitions. It's almost like your TBI is, is giving you some endogenous plavix. The question really is, we have all this information, what do you do about it? How do you intervene? Well, for our INR and our platelet count, that's pretty easy. We kind of know the answer to that. We transfuse them. You can give some PCC. 
give some platelets. <clears throat> it's less clear in TBI patients, both that are taking antiplatelet medication and those that aren't, but we've been able to demonstrate their platelets aren't working. Uh, there's a pretty significant amount of data looking at this where they take patients who have TBIs and come in and they're taking an antiplatelet medication and we're trying to decide should we transfuse, patient, transfuse platelets in those patients. Some studies are saying no difference. Some studies say there is an improvement in outcomes. Some studies say that there's actually harm to give platelets. This is a meta-analysis um, that went through five five recent studies. One study said that if you give platelets, you produce worse outcomes. Another study showed better outcomes, and then three of them showed no difference. Uh, this, this study have, uh, concluded no difference either. Um, but what strikes me about this is all of these studies are just looking at a history of you take an antiplatelet medication or not. And they're not measuring any uh, effect size. And we know from the cardiology literature that 30% of patients on Plavix are non-responders. Their platelets are working just fine. So a lot of this data is, is really hard to interpret because it's akin to just giving everyone who says they took warfarin some plasma without ever checking an INR. Um, as it turns out, in trauma patients that are taking antiplatelet medications, still about 30% of them will have normal ADP function. In the aspirin group, about 15% had normal ADP function. Uh, and so I think a lot of this data that we're getting on whether transfusing platelets in these patients is worthwhile um, is you know, kind of messy or dirty where there's a lot of crossover in the groups. Uh, the only actual outcome data that I could find looking at ADP inhibition and an intervention based on that <clears throat> Uh, came out of Austin, Texas, uh, I believe last year, and they looked at pretty much the same data we just looked at, and they said, okay, well, it looks like it doesn't really matter if you take antiplatelet medications or not. It just matters if your ADP receptor inhibition is greater than 60%. So they said, what we're going to do is, if your ADP receptor inhibition is greater than 60%, we're going to transfuse you platelets and try to correct that, and we'll give you up to two units of platelets. They did this on 35 patients when they first instituted the protocol. They compared it to 51 historical controls, all of whom had a TEG and had platelet inhibition greater than 60%. <clears throat> and with their protocol, they found a significant decrease in mortality. Uh, problem, of course, is that if you look at all the other um, characteristics of the two groups, all those other things, you would expect to decrease mortality as well. A couple of notes, they, about 20% of their patients were on antiplatelet therapy. It was a sick group, 19% required neurosurgical intervention. They did run some log logistic regression analyses to try to control for the differences between the two groups. And when they did that, platelet transfusion still um, uh, fell out as being independently associated with uh, survival <clears throat> with an odds ratio of 0.23. Um, so, you know, in conclusion, I think there's a lot of questions still around this area in um, testing platelet function. Um, the viscoelastic testing gives us a lot of information that we didn't have previously, um, but it does raise a few questions. I think platelet function likely is very important in TBI-associated um, coagulopathy, and at least right now, the, the one outcome study I can find about using platelet mapping or, or platelet function testing to guide our transfusions uh, looks promising, but I think there's certainly a lot more research to be done on that area. Uh, I want to thank you guys for your attention and uh, thank, uh, thank you for having me.